Okay, hi, AP Chemistry class. This is Mr. Mellinger. This is uh, day four, Thursday, um, January thirty uh, first, and these are your um, this is your video for tonight. Um, we'll discuss this and um, work some problems on these uh, subjects tomorrow. And um, let's get going. So, um, what is ionization energy? Um, ionization energy is effectively how much energy it takes to pull an electron away from its atom. So. Another way of, of stating that, it's how strongly an, elect, an atom wants to hang on to its electrons. We're going to learn which elements have high ionization energies, that is, it takes a lot of energy to pull the electrons away, and which ones have low ionization energy. And this is an important factor in, in chemical bonding. So the energy, the man, if you imagine this little man with the rope pulling on the electron, the energy um, that the man with the rope must use to pull the electron away from the atom is the ionization energy. <clears throat> ionization energy is the amount of energy that is required to pull an electron away from its atom. Okay. Ionization energy increases as you go up the periodic table from bottom to top and as you go from left to right. So the lowest ionization energy elements, the ones that give up their electrons the easiest because they have low ionization energy and it doesn't take much energy to take them away, would be elements like rubidium, strontium, barium, cesium, down on the lower left side of the periodic table. The, high, the, the uh, highest ionization energy elements would be the nonmetals, and uh, we'll talk about uh, the uh, different classifications um, in, a, in a later time. That would be oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, sulfur, um, and the noble gases, helium, neon, argon. Those have very high ionization energies. They're in the upper right-hand side of the periodic table. Okay, this shows uh, just kind of a perspective view of the ionization energies. The higher columns there are the higher ionization energies, the lower columns are the lower ionization energies. Um, so it's greater in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, and that's where helium is. Helium has the highest ionization energy. Yeah, electronegativity is kind of the flip side of ionization energy. Electronegativity is how much an atom wants to pull in electrons from other atoms. Now, there can be a distinction um, uh, between electronegativity and something called electron affinity. In this class, we'll, use, we'll generally use the term electronegativity. Technically, electron affinity is the... Um, is the, de is the desire of an atom to pull in electrons from other atoms, whereas electron uh, electronegativity is how strongly a polar covalent bond uh, wants to pull on the electrons within that bond. We haven't gotten there yet. We'll talk about that. But for the time being, electronegativity is how much an atom wants to pull in electrons from outside of it. In other words, take electrons away from other atoms. So electronegativity, just like ionization energy, increases as you go up and to the right. So uh, cesium, calcium, potassium, barium have uh, very low electronegativities. They have very little um, strength to pull electrons in from outside of themselves. Whereas fluorine, oxygen, uh, sulfur, chlorine have high electronegativities. They really want to pull um, electrons in. Where there's a ma major difference between electronegativity and ionization energy is in the noble gases. The noble gases do not want to take electrons away from other uh, atoms. That's because they already have full octets. And we'll talk more about that when we, when we talk about the octet rule. So here's another perspective view, and you can see that the um, upper right-hand corner of the periodic table has the higher electronegativities, and the lower left-hand side has the lowest electronegativities. And you'll notice over on the right-hand side there that there are no noble gases there. They do not have electronegativity or high electronegativity or any electronegativity. They do not want to pull um, electrons in because they are have full valence orbitals and are happy and don't want any more electrons. 
Okay, so what happens when a low ionization energy uh, gets together with a high electronegativity? So on the left hand side, you see an atom with three protons. Can you identify that atom? That would be lithium. Lithium has the atomic number of three, which means it has three protons. Over on the right hand side, you see an atom with nine protons. What element would that be? That would be fluorine. Okay, so it has nine protons. So fluorine on the right hand side, upper right hand corner of the periodic table has a very high electronegativity. It wants to take electrons away from other atoms. Lithium has a low ionization energy. That means it gives up that one electron that you see in the second orbital. It gives that one up very easily. So what do you think is going to happen when those two get near each other? The lithium is going to pull on that electron from, excuse me, the um, fluorine is going to pull on the electron from the lithium and pull it away from the lithium. So, so what happens when you put an element that has low ionization energy with one that has high electronegativity? So lithium has a low ionization energy, so it easily loses an electron. Fluorine has a high electronegativity, so it easily gains electrons. It likes to pull electrons away. So what you see is the answer is that lithium loses an electron to fluorine. So we just show that in the animation here. And there it goes. And now that electron has come, gone on over to fluorine. Atomic radius. Atomic radius in simplest terms is the distance between the center of the nuclei of an atom, the nucleus of an atom, and the outermost electron. But electrons don't have an exact distance from the nucleus. So it has to be kind of calculated as an average distance. And the way they do that is they say that the uh, rule is that if you put two atoms of the same element together, say hydrogen, to create a hydrogen molecule, H2, what you do is you measure the distance between the radii, the radiuses of those two um, atoms, and cut that in half, divide that in two, and that's defined as the atomic radius. So it's, ha it's one half the distance between the nuclei of two similar atoms, two identical atoms that are bonded together, uh, that are bonded together. Okay, atomic radius, our definition of atomic radius will be the distance from the center of the nucleus to the outermost electron. Atomic radius is the size of an atom. That's is essentially what it means. Okay, well, what about the rules for atomic radius? Well, unlike ionization energy and electronegativity, um, I, uh, atomic radius decreases as you go to the upper right-hand side of the periodic table. So oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, uh, they have smaller atomic radii. The plural of radius is radii. They have smaller atomic radii than the other elements, the elements over on the left-hand side of the periodic table, such as sodium, magnesium, potassium, strontium. Okay, there's, it's an, there's an interesting reason for this. First of all, as you go up the periodic table, you have fewer and fewer orbitals. So the atom clearly becomes smaller. That, that explanation is kind of obvious. The higher up on the periodic table, the smaller the atom because it has fewer orbitals. You go down the periodic table, as you know, you add orbitals. Why does the atomic radius, um, however, increase as you um, as you go from left to right, because you're adding more and more protons and more and more electrons. Let's first take a look at the three together. Um, the, as we move to the upper right hand side of the periodic table, ionization energy and electronegativity increase while the atomic radius decreases. And the question I was just answering is why is that? Why does the atomic radius decrease as you add more protons and more electrons to the atom? It would seem like it should get bigger if you keep adding protons and electrons. Here is, a, here is a, a, a plot of the atomic radii of different elements. So the very first element, hydrogen, has a very small atomic radii as you go over to, to um, um, that's actually helium down there in the blue next to the number 30. Now, as you go down to the second row of the periodic table, you add an orbital. That means the atom is going to get bigger. That's the yellow dot that's up near the, in between the 150 and the 180. So that would be lithium. The next element over, and we're talking, we're, we were talking about this, why does the atomic radius get smaller and smaller? As you go to the next element over, beryllium, 
that would be that yellow dot that's near the 120. The next yellow dot, the one that's near the 90, would be um, boron and then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. But the point is the atomic radius, the size of the atom, is getting smaller as you go from left to right, even though you're adding more protons and more electrons. Okay, so here's, here's why. As you go across a period or a row, more protons are added to the nucleus. The electrons are all in the second orbital. If in this case, the example I'm just giving, they're all in the second orbital. They're not blocking each other out. They're not getting in each other's way. They're all sitting about the same distance away from the nucleus. But what happens is you add more and more of these positive charges in the nucleus. Um, it means those electrons are going to be pulled in tighter and tighter. They don't crowd each other out, they don't get in each other's way, but they do all equally get pulled in together towards the nucleus because there's more positive charge in the nucleus as you go from left to right and add protons uh, to the nucleus. Therefore, strange as it may sound, when you add more protons and electrons, the size of the atom actually gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the electrons are pulled in tighter to the nucleus. So let me read what it says at the top. As you go across the period, more protons are added to the nucleus. The electrons are pulled in with greater force. This means the atomic radius becomes smaller. The energy required to pull an electron out, ionization energy becomes greater, and the ability to pull an electron in, ele electronegativity, also becomes greater. As we go down the periodic table, more orbitals are added, and this makes the atomic radius larger. That one's kind of obvious, right? You got one orbital, it's not as big as if you had a second orbital that's bigger, a third orbital is even bigger. So that's, that's kind of obvious, and that's what happens as you go down from top to bottom on the periodic table. Okay, this increased distance makes both the ionization energy and electronegativity less. In other words, as the, electro, as the um, electrons get farther and farther away from the nucleus, because remember, it's those positive protons in the nucleus that are holding them in, but as they get farther and farther away, it's easier to pull the electrons away from that atom. And so that means ionization energy goes down, and they have less and less ability to pull in electrons because there's there's more and more orbitals, there's more and more electrons blocking, um, blocking other electrons from coming in. Okay, so how do protons stay together in the nucleus? We mentioned this in class briefly. Protons have a positive charge, so two protons repel each other because of the electromagnetic force. Okay, but you can think of protons as having hooks, really, really strong hooks. And these hooks will hold the, hold the protons together if the protons are pushed together with enough energy to overcome that electromagnetic force that repels them. And these hooks are called the strong nuclear force. So you can think of it like this, those two protons, if you can get them close enough together, and that's not easy, it takes millions of degrees of, of energy, of, of temperature to give them enough energy to do that, then they will hook together and stay together and form a nucleus of an atom. So what do neutrons do? They don't seem to do anything. They have no charge to them. They're neither positive or negative, but they are in the nucleus as well, and they have these same hooks. So without having the positive charge that would repel protons, they have no charge to repel the protons, they do have the hooks that can help hold the protons together. So neutrons also contain these same hooks to keep the protons together, but neutrons don't have any electromagnetic charge, so they make the nucleus more stable. So you can think of this would be a helium nucleus with two protons and two neutrons holding it together. Okay, um, the AP does not test you on history of chemistry, but most of you have not had any chemistry. So I'm just going to go over a few names that you should at least be familiar with in chemistry. You'll hear their name. You'll hear them pop up from time to time. Um, the atomic theory was developed by uh, an ancient Greek named Democritus in about 400 BC. Democritus developed the idea that there was a smallest piece of matter that could not be further divided. The Greek word atomos means indivisible or cannot be divided. Okay. In about 1800, English chemist John Dalton developed a formal scientific theory of atoms. Now, keep in mind, at this time, they had not discovered protons, neutrons, or electrons. They just knew that, that 
all matter was made up of these little pieces. They didn't really know how those pieces were put together, what they, what they were, but they just knew that matter was made up of little pieces. And so Dalton, uh, who was actually a school teacher, came up with this theory, and it has four parts to it, that all elements are composed of individual atoms. Two, atoms of the same element are identical. Atoms of one element are different from those of another. So what we later discovered is that uh, atoms will have different numbers of protons and different numbers of electrons, and that gives them different chemical properties. Okay, the third principle was that atoms of different elements can combine in whole number ratios to, to form compound, compounds. Combinations of two, uh, two or more elements. A compound is a combination of two or more elements. So for example, you all know that water is H2O. There's no, such element, there's no such compound that's H one and a half O. You can't have fractions of elements of forming compounds. They have to be whole numbers. Chem and finally, four chemical reactions are when atoms join, separate, or are rearranged. Atoms of one element cannot be changed into another element. And um, that's what the old alchemists thought that they could change lead into gold. And what that would require is that you uh, add some protons to lead, a um, couple of protons to lead to get it to be gold, but that's not physically possible. Okay, uh, so how was atomic theory developed? So in about 1897, English physicist J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, and he this is a very famous experiment in science. He used a cathode ray tube. It was basically a machine gun that shot electrons out. And he put them through a magnetic field and found that they curved when he did that. And um, so a negatively charged plate repels or pushes away the electrons. A positively charged plate attracts the electrons. And then this creates a, a visible stream of electrons and a gas. It actually lights up the gas. So you can almost literally see the electrons. And a magnet causes the negative electrons to change direction. In 1904, J.J. Thompson proposed a model of the atom that included electrons. He believed that an atom was a positively charged ball. The whole thing was just one big wad of positive charge that had these little electrons, these little negative charges stuck in it. Uh, this model became known as the plum pudding model of the atom because it was soft with chunks of electrons in it. Plum pudding is a, is a, is a food that served in England, which is where Thompson was from. So they thought, in other words, an atom was a, was a solid object, soft, but solid, and had no space in between it. Um, in the late 1800s, Eugene Goldstein noticed that positive charges were traveling in the opposite direction in Thomson's cathode ray tube. Thomson later recognized these charged particles, and uh, Thomson gave them the name protons. The neutron wasn't discovered in, uh, until fairly recently. Um, in 1932, English physicist James Chadwick discovered a particle that had the same mass as a proton, but no electrical charge. This particle was called the neutron. Protons and neutrons each weigh about 1,820 times more than an electron. In 1911, a student of J.J. Thompson at the University of Manchester in England, Ernest Rutherford, demonstrated that an atom has a nucleus, a center, but that most of the atom is empty space. Rutherford shot positive particles called alpha particles, and these are effectively the nucleus of a helium atom. It's what an alpha particle is. It has two protons and two neutrons at a thin sheet of gold foil. If Thompson had been correct that, that um, atoms were solid, the alpha particles would have shown a small def deflection. If they were solid but soft, they would have just gone right through them. In fact, he showed that most showed no deflection, uh, meaning that they didn't change directions, and some actually bounced back, which indicated that there was a solid nucleus surrounded by a lot of empty space. So you guys Okay, in the late 1930s, um, that question on the left is uh, incorrect, uh, just ignore that. Um, in the late 1930s, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann of Germany split a uranium atom. A third scientist involved in this work was Lisa Meitner, uh, who was forced to leave Germany because she was Jewish. 
Hahn and Strassman received the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work for breaking an atom in two, splitting an atom. Many felt that Meitner was deprived of the credit she deserved, and Hahn refused to acknowledge her contribution in later years. And there's a picture of Hahn on the left, Lise Meitner in the center, and Strassman on the right, Fritz Strassman on the right. In the late 1700s, a French aristocrat and government official named Antoine Lavoisier used his wealth and interest in chemistry to make highly precise measurements. Lavoisier was the first to split water into hydrogen and oxygen molecules, and then he recombined them back into water again. Lavoisier developed the concept of conservation of mass and is known as the father of chemistry. In the mid-1800s, Dmitry Mendeleev developed the basic organization of elements on the periodic table. He did this by arranging cards with the names of elements and sorting them while riding on the trains. So the periodic table, as we know it, he did not discover all of the elements, but he got it started. And the basic organization that you see on the periodic table was done really ingeniously by Mendeleev. Linus Pauling is the most famous chemist of the 20th century. He made many advances in the fields of quantum theory, molecular orbital theory, and biochemistry. And we'll mention his name as we go through the course. Okay, so that takes care of our, our lecture for tonight, about 21 minutes. Um, go ahead and watch that, take notes on it. Um, you are responsible for this information, all of it. So you take the notes that you feel you need to try to remember. Uh, and study in the future, okay? And um, I also have uh, posted, or will shortly, if it's not up, um, a video showing how to solve today's problems, as well as just simply an answer sheet, if you just wanna see the answers. Okay, thanks a lot, we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.